Meine Damen und Herren, einen herzlichen Applaus für Professor Lionel Tiger für seinen Vortrag «Pixels and Cubism – Where is the Ancient Social in New Social Media?». Herzlichen Applaus. I have to speak English, and you will have to listen unless you're sensible enough to leave. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to, to be here. Uh, this is a fascinating city because of the connection between the old, which people treasure, and the new, which people are challenged by, and I'd like to talk about both. The conference is titled Social Media and Beyond. I'm really interested in before, what happened before. Why are there social media? Why do this particular kind of primate collect in groups and communicate and argue and love and dance and do all sorts of things? But the model is based in the past. So I will talk about the past, the attraction of the old, not only physically in the buildings and in the customs of a, a community like this, uh, but also the new, what faces us all. And I am aware that many of you uh, are here because you want some information which will help you uh, go back to your offices, if not this evening, tomorrow, and... Uh, gather a whole lot of extra uh, Swiss francs that you hadn't otherwise expected. And particularly for the young members of the audience, I feel very strongly the sense that you enter a world which is, of course, changing. You're changing it in part. And secondly, uh, you really need to know what the rules of whatever this game is that you are forced to play. I now remember... <laughs> One thing, I give lectures a fair amount, and I'm told there's a certain amount of time I have to speak, so I very ostentatiously take my watch, and I put it down, and I look at it, and then, of course, I forget immediately what time I began. So uh, if I begin speaking too long, I'll expect an insurrection, uh, because also I gather the alcohol is given after the lecture. Uh, so bearing all that in mind, I will be uh, brief, but I hope effective. An Irish poet once wrote, to the blind, everything is sudden. To the blind, everything is sudden. Jacques Monod, the French uh, geneticist who won a Nobel Prize for his work, uh, wrote, which Robin Fox and I, a colleague with whom I wrote a book, The Imperial Animal, uh, we cited his statement, tout être vivant, et aussi in fossil. Everything that lives is also a fossil. You're a fossil. Not only you, but you, too. And uh, we're all fossils. Some of us are more fossils than others, uh, but in fact, we all bear with us the result of centuries, millions of years of evolution, of genetic formulation, and this stares us in the face. Just today, there was a report about how uh, the um, lung cancer cure may depend on knowing that just several genes are responsible for permitting somebody who uh, smoked or did whatever ha but got lung cancer can be rescued by some medical treatment, but not for the whole lung or the whole disease, just for a few genes. And you probably don't realize how much genetic engineering is going on in your own life. For example, um, the hair on your eyelash is different from the hair on your arm. Some of, some of you have hair. It's different from what you have on your head or on your legs. That's coded genetically. You have no control over this. It's a brilliant system and it's produced us, and we're it. 
I was talking with an anthropologist, uh, a fellow Canadian, I'm originally from Montreal, um, and he had worked in northern Nigeria uh, among a particular tribe of people, and he lived there for 16 months, the regular period of a self-punishing anthropologist lives with his group. And uh, then he was planning to leave, and so he took a, an afternoon off, and he went off outside of the community and sat on a log and just thought about what he needed to do, what he'd learned, what were the deficits of his work. And after about 30 minutes, a young man from the village came and sat down on the other end of the, of the log, a piece of wood he was sitting on. And so Ronald said to him, uh, good afternoon, and eventually, why are you here? He said, oh, the chief sent me. Why would the chief send you? Because you're alone, therefore you must be ill. And that insight is in a way at the heart of what you're talking about and we're all talking about today. For example, if you had been told that this lecture on Facebook was to be given by somebody without a face, you would have thought, well, I don't really want to go there. And I won't let it go long enough, but after a while, some of you will start getting very uncomfortable because you can't see my face. The mechanism is that delicate. All I did was turn around. It's not as if I was jumping up and down. Or, I just turned around couldn't see my face. So the mechanisms underlying Facebook are very old, they're very fragile, they're very, <coughs> excuse me, they're very um, programmed. I see IBM has, uh, is a sponsor of this, quite appropriate. Uh, they've also just bought uh, Yammer. Some of you may know all of these things. To me, it's a foreign country, but Nonetheless, I know that uh, when they decide to buy some company, it's because they decide to have a yet bigger company. And they know this Yammer will do something for them. So it's appropriate. But the fact is that I could turn around again. It's, it's boring. I'm not going to do it. But the fact is that communication is always social. In fact, all the media are social. I don't understand what is this social media business. What does it actually mean? Does it mean that, that the consumer actually can have a reply? We were talking earlier about the fact that now, actually, you, you go on a trip and you want to know uh, where to eat without having to uh, get a new mortgage, and you look at some group of people who write in who may have the worst taste in food, who may be completely incompetent economists, but you will read all of their descriptions and you will end up going to X or Y restaurant. And you, you with a PhD in macroeconomics, will decide your life on the basis of some people you've never met. Uh, but who decided to write in complaining about the, uh, the goulash soup at some restaurant or another. And you, you follow it because we're gregarious creatures. If you're alone, you must be ill. And so we've, we're developing something out of what we call the social media, but it's not really social. It's in, let's characterize it as the talk back media. The consumer, the receiver, actually now has a chance, and it's because of the computer, of course. Uh, people would not sit and write letters saying, uh, I offer to my worthy colleagues interested in a Thai restaurant in Hawaii that the uh, Pad Thai is terrible at X or Y restaurant. Why don't you go down the street to X? They're not going to write this all out in the, with a pen and paper, their hands will break. But instead, they do it like this. It takes 10 seconds. It's done. And we choose what we're going to be doing on the basis of somebody's contribution of their own experience, not, let me underline, their expertise. Nobody who writes into those places, and I've used them too. I looked at, I think it was Yelp, about uh, Winter Tour. They don't say, 
you have to understand that I'm the world's expert on uh, on uh, souffles. I have I have eaten souffles here, there, and everywhere. People don't say that. They say it was a very, really nice place and it was okay. The w waiter was a moron, uh, but um, it's. It's not based on expertise, it's based on experience. But as we are told, experience is the best teacher. And there is the possibility here beyond, in the beyond phase of this ex exercise, that a body of expertise develops, which is folk expertise. And we may be on the verge of something extremely interesting, which is the rational equivalent or the informational equivalent, if you will, of folk music. You know, there's classical music where people wear long dresses and uh, even not the men, the women, and, and they play in the evening and it's very serious. And then there's folk music, which are usually young men who are interested in achieving some major uh, success with young women uh, who make loud music and jump around. And, but this is called folk music. It's a different genre. But the fact is that we're all learning to speak expertise and the uh, world of social media uh, uh, is a, w a world of folk information, which is not to say it isn't more expert than expert information, but it's a different level, different kind, a different intensity, and a different variability of information. Clearly something's going on. When half the people in the United States over the age of 12 are on Facebook or are there another two, three hundred uh, million added every day, every week, something is going on. Now, we were having a brief discussion about the share price of Facebook uh, in which some of you may actually have a very painful interest. Uh, uh, but the fact is that the reason, the, the principal reason the stock is l down has nothing to do with Facebook, but to do with the bankers who decided to raise the price to a stupid level on a daily basis. You could see, well, today it's $18, tomorrow it's 20 Thursday it's $81, whatever they decided to do, and people bought it because they understood that something is going on here. Maybe not as much as it was charging, uh, they were being charged for it, but something was going on. Now, it may not work finally for a whole series of reasons, and at the end, uh, 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 I'll come back to what might be some of the problems that this new form of communication creates. Obviously, for children, for privacy, a, a, a very interesting problem some of you may have had to endure in your own lives, which is, do you want your ex-spouse to know where the hell you are and whom you're seeing? What you're doing? that you have a new lawnmower, which she had been trying to get you to buy for X years, and you didn't, and now you have it. And do you really want to know about the tango dancer that she uh, is currently involved with when uh, you never used to get her to go to any dancing occasion? This is not trivial when half of marriages end in divorce. A whole new industry for Facebook, post-marital information transfer. But this is nothing new, this interest in, pe in people. The most successful magazine launch in the 20th century, and carries over into ours, was what? People. A, a magazine of Time, Inc., just called People. Not The Economist, not Car and Driver, uh, not Better Housekeeping, Chopping Your Onions people. Complete nonsense subject, and yet it was the most, and still is, one of the most successful publications ever. Europe has its own versions. Uh, hello, okay. Uh, so far there's no goodbye yet. Maybe there's a, a whole new commercial uh, niche here. Uh, but these are magazines that specialize in photographs of minor European royalty engaged in some sweaty uh, divorce, or m even more typically, the 
uh, houses of soccer uh, football stars before and after their divorces. And you see pictures of these very effective athletes moving into their pretty little houses uh, compared to the old one they had with the other wife. And people buy this. It's in a, incomprehensible. Very popular. People. The site is not called Elbow Book. It's not called Knee Book. It's called Facebook as close as you could get to a title called People. Uh, Marshall McLuhan, the Canadian, actually literary scholar, um, famously said, the medium is the message. And uh, that turned out to be actually very useful as a way of formulating the fact that what's being transmitted is less important than, one, that it is being transmitted, and B, how it's transmitted. McLuhan had looked at radio and, and television and film as different modalities, and uh, he may have exaggerated the point, but it certainly alerted us to the fact that <coughs> how something is communicated is a very important feature of uh, what it's about. And so, if we look back at the uh, ancient history of uh, Zuckerberg and making up this system, what was he interested in? Reasonably healthy college student, girls. <laughs> and uh, he happened to know the math and he happened to know how to do it. But the in initial impulse for Facebook, if you look at it not as an empire now, but as a thing that this young man and his associates did was to take the basic biological pattern of our species or any other species and mechanize it or electrify it or do whatever was done with it. It was the Darwinian understanding that the principal requirement that any organism, uh, the reproducing organism has is to uh, find an appropriate partner and reproduce. This is, I'm sure, not going through Mr. Zuckerberg's Zuckerber mind at that point. But in fact, it's one of the animating impulses of so very much in life. Everyone is aware of that. And the fact that uh, it was started for this purpose does not mean that the rest of what it does, it can do, uh, is uh, trivial. Or, or suffused or somehow contaminated by the original sexual impulse of this uh, uh, impulse, this mechanism. Let's stick with the genome for a moment. I mentioned the cancer gene. I'd like to just make a brief, if you will, editorial comment about, <coughs> excuse me, the fact that uh, universities where I've worked all my life have a bizarre distinction which is maintained in every introductory book about Zurich, uh, Yale, anything, you name it. Uh, universities tend to have a, they don't tend, they do have a distinction between natural science and social science. Now, does this mean that social behavior is not natural? That's the implication. Why is there this distinction? So to this day, you can go through any serious social science program and learn about the behavior of one animal, Homo sapiens, usually within the time frame of somebody's uh, car buying uh, period, 20 years, brief period of history, usually in the same area where people are doing the studies. The fact is that we have an extremely narrow view of how we got here. 
which in the social sciences is rather unfortunate because uh, we lose a sense of how we got here, what happened before. So I would have thought that one of the first things that, uh, and maybe he did do this, that Zuckerberg should have done, uh, was get a biologist to sit in the meetings. Because in fact, anything that's going to be very important to a lot of consumers has got to be relevant to a form of analysis which biologists can produce. And I don't mean just biologists who are interested in cutting up frogs and doing those sorts of things. I mean the natural biology of a species. And so my point look, in looking here at something like Facebook and the social media is to ask, well, how did they get social? What are the patterns of the social? Is it just social at random? No. If you're alone, you must be ill. Facebook and the email obviously has, have replaced the answering machine. Do you remember in the 70s or 80s, there were a lot of movies uh, of uh, very unhappy young people coming home and the first thing they would do is switch on the answering machine to hear about all the people that didn't call, all the dates they didn't have, all the invitations that their really mean, awful friend got and I didn't. But the answering machine was a way of living alone but not being alone. <clears throat> and here I don't mean to be unduly specific, but I think that those of you who are starting out in this business have a very interesting set of challenges, some of which would ac can actually be uh, lucrative if they're solved properly. I'm not suggesting that that's the function either of this meeting or of a university, though it could, we, it could be, and it's not bad if it is. Uh, but the fact is that there are changes going on in the, how the species operates, which may well be positioned in such a way to uh, be adaptable to something like the social media. Again, the fact that so many people live alone. It's astonishing. We're gregarious animals. We know from experiments with monkeys, that monkeys raised without warm, furry mothers can't function. We know all about deprived children. We know all these sorts of things about uh, children in, in orphanages who prosper if somebody comes in once a day or once a week and holds them for an hour. But now, so many people do live alone by choice or by necessity or because uh, they're sufficiently unpleasant that nobody will want to be with them. But the fact is that the normal primate pattern of continuous life surrounded by persons with whom one has kinship ties is disappearing. All of Europe practically uh, is demographically in a uh, war zone. W Russia is losing population constantly over years. The birth rates in Europe among indigenous populations are not replacing themselves. I mean the populations do not replace themselves. The Italian population, the replacement rate is 1.3 per female. Normal replacement or minimal replacement is 2.2 children per female, it's not happening. Europe in general has a series of impending and already existing crises about how to take care of elderly people because they don't have more than one child or two children and the children don't necessarily want to or can help them. The Chinese have this problem even more seriously because they had this completely idiotic policy idiotic in the sense that they didn't think it through, the one-child policy. They didn't realize that with a Confucian ethic, not a state ethic, even though it's a communist country, the idea is the family takes care of the needy, not the state. But the fact is that the state can't afford it, even though it's 
somewhat wealthier, but the family isn't there anymore because of the one-child policy. And there are a whole series of subsidiary things happening. For one, we can see it mainly in the behavior of women who have decided in China, I've done some, some work on the Chinese one-child fam, one, uh, family, uh, women are deciding not to marry, not to have children. <coughs> we have anecdotal data of rural women who have very little choice committing suicide because they can't take care of their own parents, which they're supposed to do. They can't take care of their, care of their husband's parents, which they're supposed to do. And they can't take care of their children, which they're supposed to do. They can't do it. They can't do it. So they leave. All through Asia, women are not marrying. If they're marrying, they're not having children. If they are having children, they're having them late. And the consequence is, and we could see it, for example, in uh, Korea, which uh, a generation ago was a totally patriarchal culture in which the roles were all clear and men and women had to do a certain thing and live a certain way and the men were hard driving uh, engineers, entrepreneurs, made cars, made televisions, brilliant, brilliant entrepreneurs and engineers based, by the way, on the family system, the Shaibal system, which is breaking down, but that's a separate issue. And women were subservient. They were, they were supposed to stay home, and they did, and they were supposed to raise their children, and they did. Had one, two, three children, maybe. Now it's all changed. Women now out-earn males. They are uh, kind of crazed with the idea of success. Uh, go to any major business school, and uh, if there are international students there, many of the most successful are Asian women because they very quickly figured out that they can't depend on the males. They don't want to, actually, because it's associated with that whole traditional pattern that they really no longer feel, A, they're obligated to fulfill, and B, they don't want to fulfill. That's the female side. In the US now, and I dare say in much of Europe, women between the age of 20 and 35 tend to earn more money than men do. They do better at school. Why? Because they're better at school. Schools are designed for women, for girls. Sit still, take notes, write clearly. Have you ever seen a boy with good handwriting? I don't know. I don't know where they are. They can't do it. They don't have the small muscle control. But girls can write these beautiful scripted things. I don't know where they learn them, but you can always tell the difference between an invitation if someone's still writing between a girl and a boy because you can re usually read the girl's invitation. But the fact is that there are differences in, in, in boys and girls, that, and the school system is calibrated for females. And everywhere in the US and England, there are uh, real deficits in male success. And in fact, uh, in England, the Royal Veterinarian College now has a program of affirmative action for males because there are 70% females in there. And uh, they, in fact, they know, as a result of experience, that women go into veterinarian science. They're very good. They, do, they have the highest grades. They get in. And then what happens is that they have babies, or a baby or two, and they're out of the system, and there's a shortage of veterinarians. The same is true, uh, I know for sure, in Canada with uh, pharmacists. What do you do about the question of fairness? Of course, if somebody is worth a scholarship, give it to them. If they're not going to use it, that's a separate issue, and the community has to come to terms with that. But these are the sorts of changes, tectonic changes in the world in which we're living and are going increasingly to live, which those of you interested in social media will want to observe because these people are going to communicate with each other. What are they going to communicate about? How will they do it? Who will they do it with? And what are the ways in which it can be facilitated and monetized? These are, after all, some of the serious issues. Now, 
Cubism. Why did I use the word cubism in the title of this talk? Because cubim, cubism was a very interesting artistic pattern because what it did was it showed that n every, not everything is as it is, it's more. And so if you recall those dramatic Picasso drawings of a female, there's one here and then there's a, another part of her, another shape. And uh, we live in a cubist world now. You cannot go anywhere without seeing people saying, hi, how are you? Here, take my picture, I'll take yours. <coughs> and people are taking photographs of their children the instant they're born, if not before. And they spread through the internet in a, a magical way. But suddenly, everyone's intimate experience is now available to everybody in a manner which is not quite cubist, but it is a, an extension of the one-to-one -one relationship. Forgive me if this may seem a little outrageous to you, but there's a very funny comedian in the United, Sta United States named Sarah Silverman who had a love affair with one of the talk show hosts very bright guy, and it was very serious, and they loved each other, and they, they were in all the newspapers. And then he decided he didn't like her anymore. And she was a woman scorned. And so she began to vilify him and so on. That was marginal interest. But then she said to, to a reporter who said, what's the most important thing difference now between before when you were with this guy and now. <laughs> she said, well, he can't see my vagina anymore. This was the sole source of access, if you will, that now was privileged. It was completely unpredictable and funny and sad, but real. Because that, at least, was not, open, not in People magazine. But we still have, in literary circles and in the arts, real concerns, important concerns about is something authentic? There was, of course, the uh, method actors, Marlon Brando, Al Pacino, who felt somehow that uh, to be a real actor, you had to be a real person, unlike the British-mannered, uh, characters like Sir John Gilgood and so on who could play any role in a light, dancy way. Uh, the method acting was supposed to be more authentic. And there's a wonderful book I reread before this talk by Lionel Trilling, a literary scholar at Columbia University called uh, Authenticity and, uh, and Literature. What's authenticity? What's real? One of the important writers in this field who uh, began to deconstruct, if you will, the social networks, uh, not in the electronic sense, but who caused people to doubt the power of their own experience was Irving Goffman, a sociologist in, in the US, um, whom I was fortunate enough to know, uh, but who was a very subversive man. He wrote a book in 1955 called The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, in which he made the argument that everything we do is a drama <coughs> fact. Somebody says to you, can you pass the toast in the morning? You pass the toast. That's not just passing the toast, creating movement of toast from one place to another. It's an act that has a whole series of implications. And he took the daily lives of people, like Pirandello, the playwright, did. Six characters in search of an author, remember? And said, you see, nothing is real. It's all a set of artifacts, layer upon layer. Well, that was cynical. It was bitter. It's not clear it was necessary as a, as a way of, of being. But I think with what you're concerned with here, and what we're concerned with, the communication between people, it has to posit the fact that it's real. There are certain things that are real. There are parts of my body you can't see any longer because this is 
a change. Wouldn't make any difference to anybody. Doesn't change my body. But in fact, I restrict parts of myself and certainly parts of my body. It's vital. It's not just an act, it's real. And so that leads me to want to consider what might be some of the problems created by the Facebook metaphor or reality, whatever you want to see it as. For one thing, children or youngsters. For a 16-year-old, and I, I, I'm not really expert here at all about what should be the right age for somebody to have their own Facebook page and what should, who should overlook it, what should be censored, all sorts of things. Uh, but <coughs> let's leave the issue of censorship out. There, the, the macro problem is at what point does a, a young person think they've created a life because they have a Facebook page? They have the advertisement of a life, but do they have a life? And what is the responsibility of the wider community to allow them to see the difference between a cubist view of the world and of themselves and their actual lives, their actual selves. That is to say, when you look in the mirror, you don't see another side of yourself, you see yourself. Mirrors, in fact, used to be very precious until glass making was perfected. There weren't many mirrors around. Now, of course, not only are there mirrors, there are photographs so that you're never alone. You're never unscrutinized. But what is the appropriate time to permit a child to enter a world that he or she has created? A Facebook page. I'm not sure about this. I, I, I should say I'm not on Facebook. It seemed to me I, I had enough to do with people I didn't know. Uh, so that I didn't want to expand that horizon or that universe. And, I, and I, I just never joined. And I realized I was lucky because I'm told by people who tried to unjoin that they can't. Maybe there are ways, but some of my friends are quite deft and skillful, but they can't get the hell out of there. And they wish they could. But again, I, these are old questions for you. I'm an amateur, real amateur. But it is important to ask about children uh, what they should be able to see as a legitimate life based on what's presented in the story. One final comment about the alternative to Facebook, if you will, and that, strangely enough, is sports. Uh, some of you may be tennis fans and uh, or you couldn't fall asleep and so you watched the US Open. And uh, what's astonishing about that, apart from the inhuman quality of the players who play for five hours with exceptional lack of peace, in mind, uh, peace of mind, uh, but then, after it's all over, they make these statements. And they're clear. They're, they, they know how to do it. And of course, your, your countryman, uh, Federer, is a master uh, of the statement. He's perfect. Uh, but all the others, too, they quickly learn that the first thing they have to say is how good the opponent was, and that it was a thrill to beat them, and uh, that uh, it was a good match, and so on. Uh, but then they suddenly become very clear, and there's no Facebook, if you will, interruption. It's very lucid. And here's a, a young woman like Sharapova or, or Kim Clijsters or somebody talking in an arena of 50 or 60,000 people to one interviewer, and it's going all over the world, and it's, in fact, very clear, very lucid. And it's, if you will, clean, because athletics at that level is clean, that is to say, Two people, one wins. End of story. And more than that, there's a, a human interest story when Kim Clijsters decides to retire or Andy Roddick decides to retire. It's almost a national day of mourning in some circles because these people are our representatives in the broader sense. And 
they don't need, if you will, they don't need Facebook. They need their faces. They need their lives. They need their accomplishments. They need their ability to speak. And they need an audience that is not only ready and willing, but happy to enjoy the lives of other people, even if they're sad lives. So Andy Roddick's a bright young guy. Um, very modest, he understood how to do this, and when somebody said, where do you keep your, your other big Grand Slam t uh, titles, he has one trophy, he says, well, I keep it in my study. As you can imagine, I'm not there very much, so I rarely see it. Uh, it was a charming kind of comment. I'm sure he has no scriptwriter. He's his own scriptwriter. I mention this only because I think that there's a, uh, uh, an elemental innocent quality that those of you concerned with these social media have to be fresh with respect to. You have to have uh, a sense of openness and aliveness to the fact that here are primates making connections skillfully with 60,000 people around and 600 million watching, but they're able to make comments that are very skillful. We're good at being social. We're really good at it. The question is, how much of a media connection do we need? Will we have, and I think this might be something to consider theoretically, if not in practice, as the kinship system becomes less important to most people and fewer people have cousins, second cousins, should there be a, a kinship Facebook echelon, a separate kind of kinship arrangement? Can Facebook actually do something, and I'm speaking metaphorically here, not just Facebook, can it provide something to people that their own inner lives or their own wider lives don't provide? Not only could this be seen as socially responsible, obviously it's going to be extraordinarily lucrative if it works. So when I'm concluding now, he's looking, looking at me very ominously. He, I think he's, he's harmless, probably, but I, I, uh, I can't be sure. I'm in a strange country. Um, in any event, um, the, uh, the point is that if we not focus only on beyond, but we focus on before, then we understand the instrument we're playing in this orchestra we call our lives. And uh, it might therefore be quite useful and illuminating and in a curious way, very reassuring to know that there's a ground we stand on. Thank you. Mr. Tiger, you are indeed in a very strange country, um, my words, and um, you said earlier that in the States women are better educated and earning more money than um, guys. Um, one of the examples that this is a very extraordinary country is that ladies earn 20% less here than guys, still. Well, I, I, do you expect me to answer that? Uh, I just wanted to tell you, if uh, you see poor faces, these uh, are all the ladies who are earning less money than guys do. Even better educated or more willing or whatever. I would simply say these are much cleverer women than the ones in the U.S. who made the mistake of saying that if, when I get a big job, I'm going to actually take it and enjoy it and do it. And now they're saying, well, you know, I thought maybe I'd have a child or two and uh, so what are the, many of them are doing it on their own, because the men are useless, actually. Well, that's, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Could we talk about that later at the upper uh, well, well, the yeah. useless men? <laughs> well, it's actually non-trivial, because uh, most women look around and they say, well, uh, of course, again, the Darwinian business. Uh, I was once on some panel or another, and... Uh, uh, the big issue was, should people pay for sex? So I w said, well, if you want to see people paying for sex, go to the cosmetics uh, floor of any big department store. 
what, what are these women doing? Putting on carbon derivatives all over their eyes and bodies and hair and whatever. Th this is sex, come on. And it's expensive, as we all know. Not me, but uh, we know. The fact is that people still want to make this connection, and it's, it's uh, a healthy zoo is one in which the animals reproduce. That's a good model for the Swiss government. And uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, but uh, as I said, the women in, in, in Switzerland may simply be cleverer than the ones in the US, for example, because the American women actually were on a mission. They were going to prove something, and there was the feminist movement and all that stuff. And now suddenly, uh, they're looking around and saying, well, what? How did it happen that I'm living alone, I have a child, I'm raising m myself, or I have two children, uh, and the, what's extraordinary, and I haven't read any of the books, but there's a, the most popular current book in the United States, I can't even remember the title, is uh, by a woman who writes essentially about sadomasochistic sex. And th the three of these books have been at the top of the New York Times book, book list for months. And when women are interviewed, what they like buying it on Kindle, because they don't have to show that they're reading the book. <laughs> nobody, nobody can see that what they're doing with their private lives. Uh, but the fact is that when other women are interviewed, they say, well, you know, I like being a big boss at, at work, but when I come home, I want s something. Not, not just, uh, yes, ma'am, or uh, I'll fill that out, ma'am. They want some, what do we call it, sex, life? sense of participating in some larger thing which involves a, an effective male who can do something, achieve something, or at least be not female in, in formula. Uh, so you raise a very important question. I don't know how long that will last. I would think that uh, the, these improvements, if they are improvements, will affect uh, Switzerland as elsewhere. Uh, Switzerland happens to be somewhat anomalous because it's a wealthy country with a, uh, and it's small and it has a whole series of very powerful factors that will give people options to do more than other people in other countries may have. So that may be part of the answer, but it's, it nonetheless is a critical central focus, I think, of the next 40 or 50 years, which is a profound change in the relationship between males and females. Are there any other questions? Are there any other inputs? Does anyone feel strong enough to? Please. Professor Tiger. Uh, it's an interesting way you found sort of the bridge between what we talked about earlier and then what you talked about. Two things that have come to my mind I would like to share with you. One thing is that in fact the latest statistics are showing that in Switzerland 37% of the households are single households. 37% of the population is living alone, which is an amazing number. Um, just this that you, you know, giving you a little bit support why we say it's a bit of a strange country. Actually, yes, it is, you know. And um, the second thing is, I remember in 1996, and this is the bridge you took here, which I cannot stop smiling about it. In 1996, 97, I was at Scholz and Friends uh, Hamburg in an advertising agency, and we had a briefing from America Online coming sort of actively to Europe, and the boss of America Online, I forgot his name, but I never forgot what he said, in the briefing session he told us, you know what, guys, the internet is for the lonely and the horny. <laughs> that was the briefing. The lonely and the horny. So here, I, by a lot of things that you say, I mean, I, I'm not joking, I'm really serious about it, and say so for a lot of things you say, you find here social media bridging towards Mr. Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg's and other people's basic needs, which is not only sex, but a lot has to do with it, which is very interesting, certainly in societies like ours here in Switzerland, where we have a percentage rate of people living alone in their households. So they create a world, a parallel world, where they interact with their friends. You know, how would you, how would you respond on that? Well, I, it, it seems quite clear that that's what's happening. And uh, again, it's not a world I understand very well, uh, but it, it certainly exists. The only companies uh, until very recently that made money in the internet were porn companies. 
And uh, there, uh, it's an uh, inexplicably detailed display of human sexuality available for the inspection of everybody. At, uh, it, it, only 20 years after, there was um, uh, this was all censored. As a matter of fact, it's almost comical. Uh, uh, Facebook took down an image from a New Yorker cartoon which showed an, a drawing, a bare-breasted female. Now, I don't know what's happened to Mr. Zuckerberg's allergic patterns, but <laughs> somehow this seems to me a completely strange uh, new value to uphold. But in, in terms of these numbers, for example, and this, I, I don't know about the Swiss case, but it's uh, the, the case in most of the industrial countries, 50% at least, of babies are born to women who have no husbands. They obviously have men, some of them eventually marry the, the husband, but when you look back at the history of our culture, the cathedrals, the temples, the importance of biblical and other religious backgrounds, and realize that over 50% of the children are born into a condition which 100 years ago would have been seen as faithfully uh, evil, now normal. Well, what does that mean, actually? And uh, is a faculty like this concerned with the future, sufficiently aware of the past to be able to track what's likely to happen and how it's likely to have a, a, an impact on people's immediate life and how it can be monetized, as I said? I don't think that's a trivial concern. So. If you're looking at a map, don't just put your GPS on where you're going. Look, look where you came from, too. Behalten wir das als Schlusswort oder ist noch ein Bedarf von eurer Seite? Fragen? Sonst würden wir sehr gerne das Geschenk übergeben und noch einmal tausenden Applaus für Herrn Tiger. Oh, danke schön. Danke.